We're going to turn to the New Testament scriptures tonight to think a little more about Thanksgiving, prayerfully equipping ourselves for this week of Thanksgiving and seeking to be a testimony to those that we'll come in contact with. And this is a season of Thanksgiving that leads us into the holiday season, leads us into the celebration of the incarnation of Christ and a new year. I always like the trilogy of these holidays because I feel like the Thanksgiving and the rejoicing in Christ prepares me, prepares us for a clean slate before us. God has so ordained things that we each year come to a time of uh, resolution, and I think that is a very helpful thing. Uh, I, I think it's something that should start earlier than the last week in December. And I think sometimes what the Lord does in our private personal studies and our family studies and our church studies is gets us prepared for that, uh, alerts us uh, in new ways to what the Lord has for us. We serve a great God. Every single thing that we have comes from Him. Uh, every good gift, um, the salvation that he's granted us, the provision in his son. And it is only right that we should have a season of expressing fresh praise to the Lord. And I understand from the scripture, my understanding at least is that when the psalmist talks about a new song, it's not necessarily new in origin in terms of we've never sung this song before. It's a fresh song. It's a fresh song of praise. So what happens when we come in contact with the Word of God, we see things God wants us to see, and we praise Him in a fresh way. We praise Him in a new way. We, uh, we bring those things back to Him. We return thanks, right? Favor for favor. And so tonight I want to think in terms of grace and peace and thanksgiving. And all I've done here is taken the words that lead out several of the New Testament epistles and put them together. We studied about grace. We spent a good bit of time studying about peace. And now we're in a time of thanksgiving. So the idea of grace is favor received. It's undeserved. The idea of peace is favor enjoyed. That's why grace and peace come together. Uh, faith and love are also two that come together regularly in the epistles. Uh, they go together, expression of our faith, our relationship of love with our Heavenly Father. Favor received is grace. Favor enjoyed is peace. I would suggest to you that Thanksgiving is favor returned. Favor returned. We return thanks. Favor received is grace. Favor enjoyed is peace. And favor returned is thanksgiving. We'll start in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we will not be able to look at all of these, but what we have done is taken a survey of all of the New Testament text that include this idea of thanksgiving, of gratitude. And we have already noted together that Paul regularly begins his epistles with statements about thanksgiving. So 1 Corinthians 1 will give us a really a, a testimony to even where we've started tonight with our title. We read Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place Call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, nothing lacking, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace your mercy toward us. We thank you for the peace that you have granted us, peace with yourself through your son, through your justifying work. Uh, 
We thank you for the peace that passes understanding that's available to us. And Father, we desire to return thanks to you. We desire to understand more of what that means tonight, that we might be ready responders to your favor, favor for favor. Guide us along. Give us clarity and understanding, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just going to ask some questions of the New Testament scriptures tonight. Now, the first is, what is Thanksgiving? This, this action expressing favor for favor. Uh, I would say to you, first of all, that Thanksgiving is the only appropriate response. The only appropriate response to an all-glorious God. A little bit of ahead of ourselves from our Sunday morning studies by turning back to Romans chapter 1. But we're just going to look at this tonight. We'll study it out further in our Sunday services. I'm in Romans chapter 1. What is Thanksgiving? The only appropriate response to an all-glorious God. You're familiar with this text. We have read it multiple times in the last few weeks. Paul in verse number 16 of Romans Chapter number one gives testimony. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, but, and also to the Greek. For therein, that is the gospel, in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now notice verse 18 of chapter one. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Why? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because that, verse number 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Contrast to that, glorifying him as God and being thankful, they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And what is thanksgiving is the only appropriate response to the all-glorious God, the absence of gratitude. It actually reveals darkness. It feeds the debauchery that he talks about in the remainder of this chapter. The negligence of which renders us when we are unthankful. It really renders us susceptible to fleshly pursuits. The only response to an all-glorious God. Secondly, in answer to the question, what is thanksgiving? It is the most natural expression. It's the most natural expression of spiritually sensitive saints. The most natural expression. This is part of our walk with the Lord, part of our walk before the Lord, part of our walk together, part of our witness in the world. Uh, we are to be grateful people. Let's go to the first letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians in chapter number 5. This is God's will for believers, Paul says. And Paul talks in terms of being bound. He's saying it's most fitting that we would give thanks, most fitting that he would give thanks. Uh, Paul feels naturally compelled to give thanks. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he teaches us that it's a must. He's talking about rejoicing in verse number 16. He says, rejoice evermore. This is 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Then he's talking about praying, pray without ceasing. And then right in line with that, he comes to verse number 18, and we read in everything, give thanks. We might say, why? And then Paul anticipates that and says, for this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus concerning you. So it is God's will. It is God's will as part of a relationship of those that are spiritually sensitive to the Lord to give thanks. On the same page or maybe the next page for you is 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 3. I've noted the way that Paul says this in his second letter to the Thessalonians. 
The idea of being bound. Look at verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 1. We are bound. And you probably already understand that. We're compelled. Uh, Paul says it, it's a must for us. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. It's appropriate because that your faith groweth exceedingly in the charity of every one of you, all toward each other aboundeth. What a statement about the evidence of the Holy Spirit having his way in that early church. Look down in chapter 2 and verse 13. He says the same in different words. Chapter 2 and verse 13 regarding this same church. He said, but we are bound. We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. What is thanksgiving? It's the only appropriate response to the all-glorious God. It's the most natural expression of spiritually sensitive saints. The idea of remembering, reflecting, and speaking that thanks back to the Lord. And so I pray for you and I pray for me that we are a people of thanksgiving. Uh, that that is clearly who we should be and that is Indeed, who we would desire to be, Paul uh, doesn't seem to be having to squeeze this out. <laughs> Paul doesn't seem to be struggling with this. He said, I'm just, I'm bound to give thanks. It's the most appropriate, the most natural expression of spiritually sensitive saints. How then, secondly, our second question, how is thanksgiving expressed? How is it expressed? Again, Paul has given us most of what we have about thanksgiving in the New Testament. Uh, go to chapter 1 of Ephesians now. Let me show you the answer to this question. Ephesians 1. Uh, we'll back up into verse number 15. This is Ephesians 1 and verse number 15. After Paul expresses this hymn of praise, glories in the Father and the Son and the Spirit and the saving work, Verse 15 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So we're alerted the fact that uh, thanksgiving is that which is part of our prayer life. Notice in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, this is a favorite passage of many of ours. It's a passage we're drawn to when we find ourselves anxious, filled with cares. And the Lord knows that's very much part of our life as those that are limited in our understanding, limited in our strength. He says in verse 6 of chapter 4, Philippians, be careful, take care for nothing. The answer to taking care, to being anxious, is in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And again, we see it's part of prayer. Let your request be made known unto God. How is thanksgiving, thanksgiving expressed? The first answer we have is in seasons of individual prayer and intercession. Prayer, individual prayer and in intercession for others. Paul does that. We read that in what he says in Ephesians 1.16. He tells us in Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer, watch in the same with thanksgiving. I enjoy our prayer times together. One of the patterns that I've I've continued to be appreciative of is that we have grown to understand that uh, a lot of what we're doing is thanking the Lord. And I'm privileged to hear our men, our young men, just thanking the Lord uh, line upon line for what God has done, for what God is doing, for who he is. Uh, when he writes a personal letter, Paul writes a personal letter to Philemon. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. It must be very important uh, in God's economy that these people hear that from Paul. Uh, we know it's very important that we pray for one another. Uh, 
Uh, but, but Paul just makes a point of it, doesn't he? He said, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. That's Philemon and verse number four. In seasons of individual prayer and intercession for others, um, this is an intricate part of our communion with the Lord. And so as we enter another Thanksgiving season, just listen to yourself. I'm always encouraging you to pray out loud. And I'm doing that because of my own uh, restrictions, I imagine, because when I try to pray silently, I'm, I'm pray for distraction immediately. And I believe our enemy knows that, but I believe that's part of my makeup as well, because a lot of other things come flooding in, but I think it's part of spiritual warfare, isn't it? Satan doesn't want us talking to the Lord. So I encourage you to find a quiet place and pray out loud. And one of the reasons I do that is so you can hear what you're saying. I don't think we always hear what we're saying. And I think sometimes if we did, we would say, boy, that's, I'm just, I'm being very superficial. I'm blessing this and blessing that, blessing whatever. What in the world does that mean? Well, we have to stop and say, okay, am I, am I specifically doing what I'm seeing in the scripture here? This, this Thanksgiving is part of individual prayer and intercession for others. It's an intricate part of our communion with the Lord. Wouldn't we say that it's the atmosphere in which we meet with the Lord? Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. It's the atmosphere in which we meet with God. It's the posture in which we make our request of God. We have already thanked him for what he has done before we bring our requests before him. It's the spirit in which we regard our situation and other people. Thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for so-and-so. Thank you that you have chosen to work in their lives. Thank you that we know that you are in control of this situation. Thank you that we have been reminded that only you can answer this difficulty. And then we make our request. Thank you that you care enough to take us through the hardships. We read tonight in Deuteronomy chapter eight in our time together. And um, God is speaking to the children of Israel just before they enter into the land. And he talks about the 40 years of wilderness wandering. And if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, where that first generation is instructed in Exodus chapter 16, they're complaining because they don't need food. That's the same chapter where God provides manna. I'm going to give it to you every day, six days. God did that for 40 years. He tells them why he's doing that. So when the second generation is ready to enter the land, he tells the second generation, when you had to depend upon me for every single thing, you did not have a way to have a meal in the wilderness unless I provided it. You didn't have a way to have the clothing and the shoes, sandals on your feet, 40 years However many people there were, and there were quite a few, every single need in their life was met through the word of the Lord. The Lord provided it. I did that, he said, to humble you and to prove you, to test you, to see if you'd obey me. He says, now you're about to go into the land, and I want to remind you that when you had nothing, you had nothing because I was working to test you and get you ready because you're just about to have what? Everything. Provided. You're going to walk in that land and the food, the houses, the barns, everything is going to be given to you. I'm giving you all that. But what I know about you is that you'll forget that I gave it to you. And you'll start looking around instead of remembering and thanking me and praising me and worshiping me. You'll start looking around and assuming you did something to get this. And he warns them time and time again, you will lose what I gave you. If you don't thank me and worship me for that. What happened to Israel, by the way? Did they lose what God gave them? All of it. You will be idolaters. Exactly what they did. Carried off into Babylonian Assyrian captivity. And God said, what I was trying to teach you <laughs> during those days in which you absolutely could not have a meal apart from me 
was that you need to live humbly before me. You need to live grateful before me. You need to understand that every good and perfect gift comes from above. You need to know that life is not about bread alone. It's about every word that proceeds out of my mouth. And I believe that takes in a vast testimony from God. How is Thanksgiving expressed in seasons of individual prayer and intercession for others? Secondly, in gatherings, in gatherings of shared worship and edification. In gatherings of shared worship and edification. We did that tonight. We try to always do that. Our understanding of the early church, our understanding of the things said in the New Testament is that we gather together to worship. And in that worship, we are encouraging each other and we're edifying each other. And even with the preaching of the word, uh, you say, well, what happens if the, if the preaching of the word doesn't encourage me? Well, hopefully it, it convicts you. And if it convicts you and you get things right with the Lord, what has it done? It's edified you. It's built you up. Just like the Bible teaches. You can't, you can't cover your sin and prosper. You can't live for yourself and be blessed. And so even in the preaching of the word or a song that we sing that brings conviction, that should lead you to being built back up in the truth. That should lead to edification. Let's look at it in Ephesians chapter 5. As you know, there are two texts on this. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine. And the Ephesians would be aware of that because of the intoxication of the idolatry that they came out of. Paul often reminds them in this book about the idolatry they came out of. And the idea was when you're intoxicated, there's a, there's a, there's a sensation there basically that, that breaks forth in some kind of worship. Well, he's, he's contrasting here. He says, no, be not drunk with wine, which typically leads to being out of control and dull of discernment and all kinds of other things, wherein is excess, as he says. But be filled with the Spirit. What does that look like? Speaking to yourselves. The idea here is not to yourself, but to yourselves, to one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be speaking to one another in this kind of context and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, but also giving thanks. When the Holy Spirit is having his way in our lives, we will be people that are marked by thanksgiving. Let me show you the other one in Colossians 3. We always seek to draw a connecting point for us between being filled with the Spirit, which is what 518 of Ephesians says, and being filled with the Word of Christ, because the same emphasis comes in Chapter 3 and 16 of Colossians, instead of the spirit of Christ filling us, it says, let the word of Christ, which tells us those things, they go hand in hand. Be filled with the spirit of Christ and be filled with the word of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Here it is again, teaching and admonishing one another. Same wording, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. With last phrase of verse 17, giving thanks. So the worship text, both of these, filled with the spirit of Christ, filled with the word of Christ. What does that look like? There's a mutual ministry that's going on. There's an encouragement and edification goes on. But there's also a giving of thanks that takes place. So how is Thanksgiving expressed in seasons of individual prayer? Paul's doing that, intercession for others. Secondly, in gatherings of shared worship and edification of others. Spirit-filled life patterns. We unite together. The Holy Spirit having his way moves us in this direction if we're sensitive to him.
Well, I think it's important for us to ask the question, what does Thanksgiving do? And I believe the New Testament actually answers that question. The, the influence of living lives uh, in thanks. The first answer is that it rivets the attention heavenward. What does Thanksgiving do? It rivets the attention heavenward. And that's the most important thing I have shared with uh, some of you individually and you've shared with me and the benefits of the Lord's Day when we come together and how worshiping together and hearing the word together and praying together and fellowshipping together turns our hearts, turns our minds, turns our attention heavenward. Let's go to chapter 27 of the book of Acts. I want to show you one or two accounts in the book of Acts. Again, in the life of Paul. As I am encouraged and you are encouraged to be caught up in and thinking about Thanksgiving in these next few days. Uh, you remember the situation uh, with Paul on this ship and the centurion and the soldiers and all the things that are going on. But notice in verse 20, uh, 35, I'm sorry, Acts 27, 35. And actually in 34, he says, Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. God used this desperate situation to manifest himself through this apostle. And verse number 35 says, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God. And Luke wants us to know that that was in the presence of them all. And when he had begun, uh, when he had broken it, he began to eat. So Paul gave thanks to the Lord in the presence of them all, in the presence of these pagan sailors, in the presence of these soldiers. He gives thanks to God. He turns the attention heavenward. Chapter 28 and verse number 15. There's a lot of detail in these two chapters that Luke gives us about this Venture, this adventure going to Rome. In verse number 15, he says, And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Apiphorum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. What does Thanksgiving do? It rivets our attention heavenward. I want to turn you again to 1 Thessalonians for just a moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And I'm going to read two other passages for you. It rivets the attention heavenward. 1 Thessalonians in chapter number 3 and verse number 9. For what thanks, for what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? And in that very statement, Paul is saying everything that's going on is connected to what God is doing. How, how can I thank God? How can I, how can we thank God enough? He says in 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. But you know that text that from there he goes into talking about kings and those in authority. So what Paul does in 1 Timothy 2, 1, I think again, it says now I, I want you to be giving prayerful. I want you to pray in supplication and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks for all men, specifically for those that are in authority, specifically for those that are in places where God has put them, because that will have an impact on you. I think he's saying, as you thank the Lord and pray to the Lord, remember the Lord's in control of all this. You just, you just bring these things to the Lord. And so he turns again, he rivets our attention heavenward. Secondly, what does Thanksgiving do? It puts Christ on display. I love this text in Colossians 2. It puts Christ on display. Colossians chapter number 2. I'd like for you to look at this one with me. What does Thanksgiving do? It rivets the attention heavenward. 
So when I'm giving thanks in these days and when you're giving thanks in these days, we're turning our hearts, we're turning our minds, we're turning our attention heavenward. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and as for many, as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, be knit together in love, and to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught. Notice the last phrase of verse 7, abounding therein with thanksgiving. He goes on to warn against uh, philosophy and vain deceit and tradition of men and rudiments of the world that take us away from Christ. So this thanksgiving rivets our attention heavenward. It puts Christ on display. I would say thirdly, it unites the family of God. Thirdly, it unites the family of God. All we're doing is surveying the New Testament teaching about thanksgiving in various places. And Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let me show you these two, please, in 2 Corinthians. Notice how Paul just kind of reaches out with his writings, with his letter in, and wraps his arms around the people that he's writing to. Includes them in his thanksgiving, but also is including them in the thanksgiving that's redounding to the Lord. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 1 verse, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The thanksgiving of many that unites the family of God. A couple of pages over to chapter 9. Just two verses in chapter number nine, because Paul mentions this again. Chapter nine, verses 11 and 12. You know, he's calling the people together to participate together in meeting the needs in believers lives. He says in verse 11 of chapter nine, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. When you are part of this, when you're joining in this, it causes thanksgiving to God. Verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want or the needs of the poor saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. And Paul says, as I'm collecting this offering, as I'm collecting these gifts to take to these needy saints, I want you to think of it in terms of God's people uniting together in thanksgiving to God provides an environment for encouragement and that if we get to be part of this, he says, you get to be part of this. I get to be part of this. The church gets to be part of this. The people receiving this get to be part of this. And with all of that, what happens is more and more thanksgiving is going up toward God. You know, one I hadn't thought about necessarily before is that it counters corruptive influences. Number four tonight. What does Thanksgiving do? It rivets the attention heavenward. It puts Christ on display. It unites the family of God as all of us are giving thanks. But fourthly, it counters corruptive influences. When I came to this text and looked at it and saw what was going on, I thought, I, I think this is part of what Paul's doing. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. These, these, this emphasis on Thanksgiving comes at some unusual places, doesn't it? When it comes in Romans chapter 9, 1, we're not quite ready for that. Uh, when he talks to Timothy about it, we're not quite ready for when he's talking about all the characteristics of a, a world uh, that is given over to a departure from the faith. And part of it is ungratefulness. But here Paul speaks to that in verse 1 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. He said, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, 
Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, hath given himself for us, an offering, a sacrifice to God for sweet-smelling savor. All a beautiful testimony, all a beautiful uh, foundation for, for where we should be walking in love. And then he turns and he says, but fornication and all uncleanness. Remember, this marked the lives of the Ephesians before Christ or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. That's, that's not becoming of saints. Goes on and says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient. Now notice what he does at the end of verse 4. But rather giving of thanks. Instead of this, give thanks. And he turns right back to those corrupt things. For this ye know that no whoremonger and no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye the light of the Lord, walk as children of light. I, I just would say to you that I, I would not have anticipated that little phrase being in the middle of all that. But it has caused me to stop and say, well, obviously that's part of what's going on here. That when I'm living a life of thankfulness to God, of worship to God, of praise to God, that actually is part of what God uses to counter all the pressure to flesh and to sin and the wickedness, all the things that would draw me away. So I think we have to put this together with other things that Paul teaches us, all other things the New Testament teaches us about our Christian walk. What does Thanksgiving do? Well, it rivets our attention in heaven. Where it puts Christ on display. It unites the family of God, but it also counters corruptive influences. I don't know if you've thought of that before. I don't think I've connected that uh, with the fact that as when I'm not giving thanks, when I'm not actively giving thanks, I'm more susceptible to all the old things that used to mark my life. I'm more susceptible to the things that would press in on me that are everywhere around us. And then lastly, and, but I think uh, in somewhat of a conclusive way, it ministers blessing. It ministers blessing to every participant. What does Thanksgiving do? It rivets the attention heavenward. It puts Christ on display. It unites the family of God. It counters corruptive influences and it ministers blessing to every participant. And in a general survey of how this word is used, how this emphasis comes in the New Testament, uh, I, I believe these things will help us. I believe these things are intended uh, for our edification. We express our thanksgiving and prayer and intercession for others. We share it together in worship and edification. To be unthankful is an inappropriate response to an all-glorious God. To be thankful is the most natural expression of spiritually sensitive saints. Let's pray together. Father, this is much like the challenges of prayer in your word, that it's it's not that we can even come to the subject of prayer and not feel a sense of uh, failure to, to enjoy and participate into this wonderful entrance into your presence that you've granted us. And Father, part of that is, is no doubt this thanksgiving. And to see it in such vivid terms as that which marks a society that is rejecting and refusing to give you glory. To see that it is included with Paul's warnings to Timothy about perilous times. They'll be marked by ungratefulness. We as your people bow here tonight and would ask you to help us. Help us to see where we are failing to live in gratefulness to you. We're failing to see that even in barren times and in difficult times, you are working out your purposes, that you have allowed these things for us, even as you taught us in Job. Uh, 
And you are doing things that will advance your kingdom if we will embrace what you have for us the way your word teaches us to. And I pray that you would minister grace to us and grant us the thankfulness, the gratitude, uh, as we seek to put these things uh, more into place in our lives. Forgive us for uh, superficial praying, uh, childlike uh, a staying in a, in a childlike fashion and saying the same thing or essentially nothing to you when we have the privilege of living in communion with you, bringing all of these things before you and hearing from you, recognizing our dependency upon you. May we not be forgetful like the Israelites. May we not go out from this place and look around at what we have and think that we have done this. We have earned this. We can do this. Our Father, that was perilous in the day of the Israelites, and that's perilous in our day. But help us to recognize that all of this has come from your hand. I pray for these men, these husbands, these dads, as they lead their families in Thanksgiving. May this be a challenge to each of us that Thanksgiving should be in the environment that's in our home. Not merely a frustration because someone has failed to say thank you to us, but an environment in which we live in gratitude and thankfulness to you and thankfulness for what you're doing in the lives of others and through the lives of others. I pray for our fellowship of believers here. It would be a sweetness of gratitude that we wouldn't take for granted anything, that we would speak our thanks to you and to one another. Father, we'd be built up with these things. Thank you for granting us another holiday season, for granting us safety and gathering in this place, for granting us afresh the promises of your word that tells us you're never going to leave us, you're never going to forsake us, you haven't forgotten us. May it be that we don't forget you. Stir our hearts, we pray with these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.